much. Hope you all enjoyed lunch. My name is Rachel Wormsley and I'm the Policy and Law Reform Director at EDO New South Wales. And for those of you who aren't familiar with EDO, we're formerly known as the Environmental Defenders Office. Um, we're a legal centre and we specialise in public interest environmental lawyer, law. As I just said to Robert Hill, we are boring lawyers. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to chair this last session for two reasons. Uh, first of all, like Michael Kennedy, I have always had a bit of a soft spot for the CBD. Maybe idealistic, but always had a soft spot for the CBD. And as Robert Hill said, there has been amazing pro progress with the Nagoya Protocol. But it's becoming clear that to effectively address high seas biodiversity, investigation of a new instrument or agreement under UNCLOS is essential. My second reason why I'm happy to chair this session uh, is it beautifully contrasts the government and the non-government experience. I have had the pleasure of witnessing Alistair in action at the international UN and FCCC meeting. And I have to say it was a lesson in tenacity, uh, a little bit of rugged charm, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, complete with a talking to from a very harassed looking head of delegation who took Alistair aside and said, please stop sending those media releases back to Canberra. You're making our job very difficult. So, <laughs> It certainly was an education. I look forward to hearing his perspective. But first, I think it's only fair that we give the government of the day a chance to, <laughs> to get a word in here. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Donna Petrochenko. There's an extensive rap sheet that you've all got in front of you that I won't, I won't read out. Uh, Donna clearly has extensive experience in public service in both Canada and Australia. and is also a veteran of international negotiations. Uh, so it's a good indication of knowledge levels when an experience when every single speaker before you mentions you. No pressure, Donna, but <laughs> they've all referred to the amazing things you're about to say about what the government is currently doing. <coughs> so I'd like you all to welcome Donna. Thank you. organizers um, and to distinguished panelists from this morning. It's an honor to be here to talk about Australia's contribution to this important topic um, and to really speak to so many colleagues who've been working on this for such a long time. And in preparation for this, uh, I was going back over, and I'll say it, my 10 years here plus in Australia now. And one of the first things that I did when I came to Australia was I chaired a, a high seas conference on biodiversity in Cairns in 2003. And it was right after uh, Senator Hill uh, mentioned this morning about the discussions at WSSD, or the World Summit on Sustainable Development, the Johannesburg meeting. And Australia, at that point in time, uh, took leadership of one of the initiatives, and it was on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, even though it wasn't called that at the time. So I just have a few little uh, slides here, so I'll be a little different from uh, those that went before, but they're really because I need to show you some maps, but I'll also highlight a few things. Uh, if we can go to the first one, what I won't do is because uh, it was mentioned this morning, the history, and this does summarize a number of things that Australia has been involved in. And these are, uh, a lot of work went on at the United Nations level. Um, when he was ambassador at that time, Robert Hill took a leadership role uh, in a number of these initiatives. Uh, the UN office uh, in New York uh, has constantly uh, led a number of uh, a number of initiatives, including Friends of the Oceans, that Australia has managed to pull together in the lead up to Rio Plus 20, and really pull together a number of countries who have an interest in the oceans to try to raise the profile of oceans issues and specifically issues beyond national jurisdiction. One of them, which isn't mentioned here directly, was alluded to this morning, was the work on bottom trawling. 
And that, um, if you've been around a long time, you know that some of the work that the UN did that was most significant in the fisheries area, aside from the UN fish stocks agreement, would have been uh, the ban on drift net fishing. And then the mo more recent action was on bottom trawling. Why that's significant is because it, it's going to be coming up in what I have to say later on. Um, it is the, can the UN do things to improve fishing without having an implementing agreement. And while we all thought at the time that the UN resolution on bottom trawling was a big step forward, maybe in retrospect, it might not be. And that's an interesting way of looking at things and I'll, and I'll talk about why. But in all of this, there's a lot of work that's gone on in the United Nations and what you learn from multilateral work is that progress is not measured um, in months or years. It's really a decadal situation. And so, <clears throat> while we're sitting here, <laughs> 10 years from 2003, um, I have to say I think we've made great progress. Uh, what happened at Rio, and I had the honour to be the head of um, the official side of the Australian delegation to Rio, I was very thrilled with the results that we got. The results that actually said that the UN General Assembly will make a decision by 2015. That, as, as was said this morning, is a huge step forward. There's a deadline, it's a real deadline. And if it wasn't for what happened in Rio, we wouldn't be here today. We would have put this off yet again, yet again. And so while it was very difficult negotiations at about three in the morning, the night before the final document was put to bed, there were a few of us in the room, um, and the United States was there. And Graham, they didn't stop it. So while well, you say what you say about the United States, it's better to have them in the tent and try to sideline them um, as the momentum gets moving along. So we did get that into the document. Australia played a role in, in pushing it, but we tend to talk about Australia's contribution. I can't do that without mentioning uh, small island developing countries and the Pacific Island countries. It's the work that Australia has done with those countries, especially in the lead up to Rio Plus 20, because the countries that are affected a lot by what happens to our oceans are those small island developing states. There are so many of them near us that they are important neighbours, and the more we work with them to help raise these issues on the national stage, that's in their interest, it's in Australia's interest, and it's in the broader interest as well. So it really was through the work in the lead up to Rio that oceans issues came to the fore and the issues around high seas. What is in that document, Rio, the, the future we want, focuses a lot on fisheries. And a lot of our discussion this morning was on fisheries. Um, if you had a look at my CV, it doesn't really say it there, but way back when, um, I was a fishery manager. So I'm thrilled to see uh, some of the things that are in there, even though, frankly, they're not much different than what was said in Johannesburg. The question is, have we got the timing right to really make it happen now? And I'll talk about where we are in the discussions um, and where I think uh, things might be able to move in the next 18 months or so. So if you could move to the next one. Um, what are some of the th constraints and possibilities? Uh, here, what we're highlighting are some of the things that Australia's been working on. What I had on the first one was Australia's been working at the UN level. We've been working with partners to raise issues and to move things forward in that forum. What we're also doing and have been over the last 10 years is on this list. I'm a strong believer in you can't advocate internationally unless your domestic house is in order. And so the Aus Australia over the last uh, number of years has been focusing on management within our exclusive economic zone, marine bioregional planning, the creation of a network of marine protected areas around our EEZ. And we've also been concentrating with our neighbours and saying if we're trying to tackle a big problem, we have to do it domestically and we have to look regionally. 
We worked with Coral Triangle countries as a partner to improve marine management uh, to our north, east. Why is that? Because what those countries do have a direct impact on Australia, our safety, our security, the health of the oceans beside us. It's the same thing in working with the Pacific Island countries. We also have complementary uh, measures that we're talking about uh, with New Zealand. And this is everything from how do we improve marine management, uh, for example, with Coral Triangle countries or the Pacific Island countries, moving from destructive fishing practices, uh, things like um, cyanide poisoning, uh, very destructive practices that not only to corals and, and benthic habitat, but also to people who get arms and legs blown off through dynamite fishing. So we're working on those types of initiatives and we're working on marine protected areas and also recognizing that the health of coastal communities means vibrant societies and more stability and security on a regional basis. There is a question, though, about the Indian Ocean, and I'm going to come back to that. Because that's probably one of the weaker links if we look regionally around us. And of course, all of these things, you can't just act locally, domestically, with regional partners, because we don't have, have EEZs that line up perfectly. There are areas beyond national jurisdiction we need to worry about. And, as a global citizen, we need to worry more broadly about what's happening not just because uh, where we sit in the world, but because Australians, by our very nature, uh, care about biodiversity, species, and one thing I spend a lot of my other time on, it's not in my biography there, but I am Australia's commissioner to the International Whaling Commission. So we care about um, the health of species, large migratory species and species more broadly. If I could have the next one, which is my favorite map, now, this one normally has a little thing on the bottom that says not to be distributed outside the Australian government, so um, you can't take a copy with you, so if you have a photographic memory, please don't. Um, what we've tried to show here, because when people talk about the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction, you think it's kind of this area way off there, and maybe there's a few RFMOs and things happening, and it really, there's just these lines around the EZs and then there's nothing. It's this free for all out there. It's not true. And this is the problem. All of these lines and acronyms represent some type of body, a regional or an international body that has a role beyond national jurisdiction. The majority of them that you see, for example, IOTC, that's the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Um, so, these are, most of them are RFMOs, but there's also regional seas agreements that exist under the United Nations. There are also sectoral organizations that can't even really show up here unless you look at some of the things they put into place. Under the International Maritime Organization, you have particularly sensitive sea areas. So those are closed areas on the, on, <clears throat> on um, the high snow. Some would call the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction that are here too. So when you look at what do you want to do beyond EEZs, there are players out there. And solving the problem of governance has to take into account that you're not dealing with the blank sheet of paper. Now, when I mentioned earlier the Indian Ocean, if you look at where Australia is situated and all those lovely green things around us are the network of marine protected areas. So the green, emerald green, are marine protected areas that are in place now. So you can see how we can work with New Zealand, with the Pacific Island countries, the Coral Triangle countries, and there are a number of bodies. There's a few, seems to be more activity over there. But if you look in the Indian Ocean, there's not a lot. Um, and that's going to be a huge problem in the coming decades. And we, as a country, need to look at the Indian Ocean and how we position ourselves um, for environmental reasons, for safety, security reasons, for a number of reasons, but it also plays into the high seas discussion. The other reason why <clears throat> excuse me, this map is important is that when you go into international discussions as Australia, <clears throat> you have to recognize 
that the problems we might face in our end of the world, looking at the high seas or beyond national jurisdiction, is different than other places in the world. Because when you talk to your colleagues in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm so pleased to see um, that the Right Honorable Paul Martin is here from Canada, because Canada's problems and the way it looks at the high seas issues are quite different from Australia. So is it if you're Norway or Iceland? Because your part of the map up there is really different than what we have. If I can use the North Atlantic as an example, one of the things that has come up in discussions at the UN is that what's the problem? Why is there a problem? Because all you need is for the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization to talk to OSPAR, which is the environmental regional organization that exists in the North Atlantic. That's happening. The two of them can talk together and they can have marine protected areas and fishery closures that work together. So why do we need an implementing agreement? And so the answer that a number of countries up there have to the problem is there isn't one. Iceland says we can just work through regional bodies. Canada says, why can't we just look through work through regional bodies? It's different when they look at their part of the world. The answer to that question comes when Argentina stands up and says, that's fine, but we don't recognize OSPAR. All it is is a bunch of regional countries that have got together and don't have a global imprimatur to do anything. We don't recognize it. So while you might close an area off, Argentina won't recognize it, nor will the rest of the world. So the biggest argument that's happening right now at the UN is regional approaches can solve the problem. You don't need an implementing agreement. And so for a lot of countries, if you look at where they are, there's all kinds of bodies there. All it means is those sectoral bodies should get together. You should get a closure from the International Maritime Organization, from the RFMOs, in the same place, you would create some, use a regional seas body to be the manager, and you would close that area and manage it. And everybody in that region would agree and it would all be fine. But then you still have the problem that the only people who recognize it are the ones who are part of it. And if you've been around fisheries for a long time and look at the history of regional fishery management organizations, the arguments have been made by some that the region why, reason why RFMOs have not done well is because it's only those with an interest who make the rules. Is that what we want to do for a shared resource, for biodiversity? Is it, do we only want to have regional approaches where it's people who have a regional interest and they're the ones who should decide on something that belongs to the globe? countries right now who are arguing against an implementing agreement agree that regional approaches and existing mechanisms can make it happen. So what I'm trying to do in, in the discussions that we're having in the Australian delegation is trying to show to countries is you need to look at it from our perspective where we are in the world. That it's not the same everywhere in the globe. You need to look at at what the interests of developing countries are in their spaces, and perhaps it's a combination of an, of an implementing agreement with regional approaches that will help close the gap. So those two very different views have to come together, and that's what will happen, we hope, in the workshops um, and discussions over the next while. Now, that's kind of some of the existing mechanisms and things that are in place for existing bodies, things that we manage today. But if I can <coughs> move to the next slide, the discussion becomes even more complicated when you add in all these things. And these are things, some of which we've been dealing with for a while, um, but some of which we haven't even started talking about beyond national jurisdiction. Open ocean aquaculture. It's going to happen in areas beyond national jurisdiction. How, will that, how is that going to be managed? Is it going to be managed 
by a regional fisheries management organization that is really about wild capture fisheries? What about the conflict that might happen? There's all kinds of things going on, and we heard about some of them in terms of marine genetic resources and synthetics. Uh, what are the challenges with that? If you look at the harvesting that is going on now uh, for genetic resources, people would say, and we've had it at the workshops in New York, there isn't a lot of it. There isn't a lot of it. We don't really need to worry about it right now. But there are patents out there. They belong mostly to a few countries. That's what the G77 in China are concerned about. They're worried about patents for things, uh, for genetic material. And why are they worried? If you've seen some of the scientific presentations, you'll see that there's this, for example, a giant clam that exists at great depths. And this giant clam, some scientists believe, has the genetic structure that can be used to create a synthetic uh, replacement for hemoglobin. So if that is true, and that has the potential out there, think of the implications and think of the financial results. Who should share in those benefits? The resources in, tied up in marine genetic resources might not happen in the next decade but it will happen decades from now. And so the question that was raised earlier about do we wait until there's a problem and the crisis has happened, or do we try to proactively put a proper regime in place? You'll be affecting, however, existing interests because there are companies, companies out there that are commercializing genetic resources now. And those companies are represented at the negotiation table by a number of countries who, again, don't see a need for solving the problem because everything's fine right now. And should we share in that benefit or should it be controlled uh, by a few companies, countries? Uh, you look at this list and there are a number of technologies that are going on that it's not just the technology itself, but it's how it's done and what um, implications are for the marine environment and for biodiversity. The other thing that this, what gives my, just my thought bubbles, sorry, there's no logic to it, they're just thought bubbles. If you compare this to the previous map, when you bring that all together, what do you do about intersectoral conflict? And so while the fisheries people might get their act together as they have on bottom trawling and say, well, we've solved bottom trawling. The UN told us we need to make sure that we don't affect vulnerable marine ecosystems. And if we do, we have rules in place to move on. Um, we have to have closed areas for VMEs and all the rest of it. So imagine if you do that and you're a good upstanding citizen as part of an RFMO and in walks the International Seabed Authority and to the exact area that you've closed to bottom trawling, they give a license for deep sea mining. So you've closed it to bottom trawling because you think it's a vulnerable marine ecosystem and there you are watching your millions go away because you're not accessing those fish and the same habitats being affected by seabed mining. Those conflicts are starting to happen now in this area, and I can never pronounce it right, Alistair, the Clarendon Clipperton zone, correct? Almost. So that's in the Pacific, and it's happening. How we can't manage these right now, there are gaps. If you take regional approaches, that's not going to work. How do you manage the intersectoral conflict? And on the topic of bottom trawling, I did mention it earlier, and I want to say a few things because we spent so much time talking about fishing earlier this morning. A lot of times when you talk about biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction in the international fora, everybody says, but we've got fishing figured out. We've got the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. <clears throat> that was fantastic. And the United States is the biggest cheerleader for the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. So they would see, and those who support 
Tantra as you don't need anything else. Why do we want anybody else who's not involved in fisheries telling us how to do things when we have an implementing agreement under the UN law of the sea? And even though there were weaknesses pointed out by the UN because of bottom trawling, we fixed that. We listened to the UN and we fixed it. So leave us alone. Fisheries should be exempt from anything to do with an implementing agreement. Because as we've seen in bottom trawling, we don't have a problem anymore. So that's why, while a number of us were so thrilled when that happened, in fact, we need to show that it was a step forward, but it hasn't solved the problem. And not all regional fishery management organizations has, have the competency, nor the will of the parties, um, to live up to what they need to do. So part of the solution is there, but it's not all there because of the intersectoral conflict. And it's, you add these new and emerging uses to the existing bodies, and you can see why moving to a decision by 2015 is going to be very um, long process, even though it'll be in a protracted period of time. So if you can move to the next one. So what are those discussions going to focus on? Um, we negotiated uh, in August the language that says we will continue to meet, etc., etc., and we will work out the scope, parameters, and feasibility. So each country will be asked to make a submission on the scope, parameters, and feasibility. Now, people will say, what's feasibility doing in there? The only reason why feasibility is in there is because there were a number of countries who didn't even want to have any further discussions. And so we said, well, if you don't want to have further discussions, we'll put feasibility in and you can say it's not feasible because you can argue that, put in your submission that then says it's not feasible to have a, an implementing agreement because our fishing interests are covered by RFMOs and Iceland was happy. So that's why feasibility is there. Uh, the countries will talk about the scope, what should it cover, what shouldn't it cover, what are the parameters, meaning yes, uh, for example, it should cover um, genetic resources, and we think genetic resources are limited to the water column. Everything else the International Seabed Authority has jurisdiction over from country X's perspective. Country Y can say, no, we think genetic resources in the seabed should be part of the mandate of the International Seabed Authority, and you can put that in your submission. So, that's when we're looking at individual countries putting in their submissions and covering these types of issues. And, and in, as in any UN discussion, while you're dealing with those substantive issues, you have to deal with things like capacity building. And that has to be covered. You're, we're going to have to deal as well um, with technology transfer, because countries will argue, I have an interest but I don't have the capability yet to pursue that interest. Somehow this agreement's going to have to cover capacity building and technology transfer. So each country will be asked to make these submissions. They'll be made potentially by individual countries and blocks of countries, if you know how the UN operates in terms of the, the, the blocks that exist. Now the good news is that up until now the G77 in China have had a pretty good position on this. Um, this will take a lot of work for them to come up with an overall submission if they do. So we'll know. Uh, right now what's happening at the United Nations is a discussion um, of what's called uh, the, the Resolution on Fisheries and Oceans of Law of the Sea. During that uh, discussion is when the dates for next year's meetings will be set. Um, what's being discussed is potential for a meeting in April and I believe August next year and then another one in 2015 to lead up to a potential recommendation to the General Assembly about a way forward. So countries, including Australia, will have to make these submissions and uh, we will have a process yet to be determined to get stakeholder input um, into, our, into our submission and share that with you. We have had uh, 
in, uh, prior to the August meeting, a stakeholder roundtable, which we held in Canberra, and a number of you uh, participated in that. So we'll continue that dialogue as we prepare our submission. But I think the important thing to start thinking about is how will we look at existing mechanisms and how they would work with a potential new implementing agreement. Should there, are there areas we believe from an Australian perspective should be included or excluded? And we need to really look at that um, across all the sectors and bring the sectors together. And in my experience working on oceans issues, the most difficult aspects are making sure you have the right people in the room representing all aspects of industry because you can't come up with a solution for some of these governance issues and important ones like this unless you involve stakeholders, civil society, and industry. So those, there are some industry people here, so hopefully um, we'll be hearing more from, the, from you in the coming months. If I could move finally to my last photo or slide, this is the one I like the most because what I like showing this especially at international meetings or, or even in discussions uh, with colleagues because they don't have a perspective of, of this part of the world. And when you try to, when you explain why um, there are gaps in governance, if we look at it from where we sit in the world, it's a different picture. And we, if to move forward more broadly, uh, we need to recognize that while we need a global solution, it has to recognize that the regional parts may be different, uh, but the solution will need to be the same. So thanks very much for the opportunity, and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Donna, for that presentation. That was very thought-provoking, and I'm sure most people in the room will be very happy to hear that you are interested in hearing input from a range of stakeholders on the ongoing process. Uh, as I foreshadowed, our last speaker of the day, Alistair, is a veteran of uh, long-standing multilateral negotiations uh, and has been working for the Humane Society for a long, a long time on these issues. Um, most recently, you're freshly back from the camera meeting in Hobart, and I look forward to hearing your perspective on this. Thank you, Alice. Yes, thank you very much. I've got more names on my map than that. It's more up to date. I've got CO for Southern can Indian we, Ocean Fisheries. Can we take it by the way? But I want to make a slightly different point with this one. This is just fisheries, I might say. This isn't shipping or mining or anyone else. This is just fisheries. Um, and somehow we're supposed to get all these people to cooperate. All the governments that are members of these bodies have sworn blind for 50 years they're going to cooperate with each other. The question is, how are we actually going to get them to do it? This is the key answer. This is why we need a game-changing circuit breaker of some kind to try and get all these alphabets to actually talk to each other. I, I hesitate, this is not my work, I pitched this. This comes from uh, a guy called Johan Williams, who is the uh, chair of NEAF, which is Northeast Fisheries thingy, and also the chair of COFI, which is the FAO's Committee on Fisheries. One of the most senior and experienced fisheries officers in the world, and he's a Norwegian. You know, like these guys have sat and watched it, and they're nice and proper. If you want to cooperate, you've actually got to get the message right. This is really good cooperation. This is NIAC, a bunch of hard-nosed fishers beating up an OSPA, a bunch of softy nature conservation people from Europe. The rest of the world might like to think this is a wonderful example of cooperation. For those who are on the inside who did it, this is the image that's in their head. This is cooperation at work. If we want to change the game, we have some work to do. And uh, he gave this talk just uh, a month ago, champion of Leave us alone, just go away. We can manage our corner of the world. The message is changing. These guys are saying we do need to get a new model of cooperation going, and this is the message they're sending out to their own people, not to us yet. They, <laughs> they may get killed in the medicine of speaking in their own world, but they know it has to change. Next one. 
and also to sweep and no, this is tuna world. Then notice this, tuna world is everywhere. Next one. So is bottom fishing world is everywhere. Next one. And that's the fishers. And then these are the coastal state regional seas body that UNEP has been co or coordinating for years. And you'll notice when they talk about their areas of responsibility, they're beastly vague about what they're talking about. Um, but what it all adds up to is you've got lots of people having completely different conversations about the same place. Surprise, surprise, everything falls through the, through the gap. Next one. And the, but the important thing about the Norwegians, as we all know, they're stupidly rich because they've got lots of oil and no people. Um, and they've got a bigger super, superannuation fund than they know what to do with. So they're actually seriously thinking about what they're going to do with their wealth. And they're nice people. They want to actually make it a nicer world. This is their planning to actually get people to cooperate in West Africa to try and stave off complete and utter disaster. And you'll notice it involves everyone having MOUs with everyone else, which again is no use unless you know what you're having a conversation about. No one's told these people whether they're supposed to be having a gang war, whether they're supposed to be hugging each other. They don't know. The international community has got to have some way of sending messages to these people about what they want, we want them to do. Next one. And we have started sending messages for a long time. This is, again, this is the Norwegian view of the fishing world. Is you, you've got a bunch of hard law treaties we've signed that are binding, even if they don't have enforcement provisions, so what the hell. Um, and then you've got non-binding instruments, which is lots of things we've signed up, saying we like sharks and we like seabirds and we think overcapacity is a bad thing, but who cares. Um, so that, that speaky, wordy environment already exists. What we're missing is some drivers to make anyone actually pay attention to the stuff. Next one. Um, and th that's not enough. This is some of the stuff that I work on, like agreements that are in the making. The global record on fishing vessels, we don't even know who's got fishing vessels out there. Um, a, a couple of colleagues of mine, just for fun, presented the Chinese government with the first ever national compilation of fishing vessels um, flagged to the Chinese flag. China does not have a national fishing register. Um, they don't actually know how many boats they've got doing what. Um, you know, this is sort of serious. You know, these major corporations with dubious moral values all over the world, and we have no idea who they are and what they're doing or where they're going. Um, someone ought to think this is a bit of a problem. And I'm pleased to say that uh, um, Prime Minister Martin did raise this problem. It is a serious problem. Um, when the, the, um, the Plum Bay massacre happened, it happened because the, the, the people who had dubious intention knew that if you got on a Pakistani fishing boat and went to India, no one would say hi because it's just a fishing boat and they do it all the time. Boom. Something has to change. Um, Port St. Mesa's agreement, a brilliant proposition. It's a choke point where all this stuff at sea comes together. Someone has to come to land somehow to make a buck. Um, it's, a, it's the most brilliant place to start work. But we have an agreement, but almost no one signed it. We need serious diplomatic effort to say, sign this damn thing, implement it, and make it happen. Um, similarly, the Cape Town Agreement on Fishing Vessel Safety, we've had an agreement on safety of merchant ships for 35 years. We can't get one on fishing vessel safety because people don't care. This is the third attempt to try and get an agreement, which has not been ratified. Um, and again, how is it that we let these fishing, fishers go around doing whatever they like? We do have an agreement on um, training and watchkeeping and standards for fishing vessels for the first time, the parallel one we've had with merchant vessels for a long time. We have the fish stocks agreement, which is great, and as people have re referred, it is interesting, but a lot of countries haven't signed it. And again, to be fair to the US, I've watched the US for years, put serious diplomatic resources into trying to get some of the big players in the world, like Japan and China, to ratify this, so it will set a norm. And then my own little personal thing with my, my WWF mates, we're going to try and start up a project to try and raise the profile of all this. You've got all these agreements. Who's signed them? Who's ratified them? Who's implemented them? And the big thing of all, which we haven't mentioned yet, a lot of this happens through flag states. Forget about what all these economies are doing. Um, half the world's merchant tankers are flagged to Liberia and Panama and Belize. Um, almost the entire LNG fleet in the world is, is flagged to the Marshall Islands. We're talking about some very strange power relationships here between the people who do the work and the governments are supposed to look after them. It's a serious wild west out here. Next. And things do happen. This is bottom trawling. Um, it's, it's important to comprehend that there are big things at stake here. We, lose, we can lose a lot here. Don't worry, Martin. It gets better. Next one. Um, but the miners are coming. 
This is the clarion Clipperton zone that Donna referred to. Mexico over there, Hawaii over here, Kiribati down here. Um, all the colored bits uh, are ex exploration licenses that already exist. The green bits are some non-mining areas that some well-meaning people at the ISA managed to stuff around all the exploration license to try and give us a chance to try and capture the opportunity to conserve and protect some of the range of interesting stuff you find on the bottom there. If we got to it rather late, if we had a blank bit of paper, those green bits would be somewhere else, but they had to fit in around uh, where the miners had already got to work. Next one. And um, the ISA, this is the Seabed Authority, does have a framework for actually setting up those green areas, but the politics actually getting these bodies to make these decisions is really hard. Just because you've got the opportunity and the means doesn't mean to say it's going to happen unless there's someone out there saying this is the job. Next one. Um, and similarly, they, they do, well, sorry, this is emerging thinking about how the Seabed Authority might have the environmental impact assessment process to take it through this conversation. But again, this is just academic blah. Turning this into actual rules that actually get taken care of is a, is a serious job. Um, and again, there's some really interesting stuff. This is stuff in, in ocean, mid-ocean ridges spreading. All this interesting stuff comes out. Somehow, beasties and things live down here. We, we, the, one of the big things, this isn't the oxygenated green world that we live in. We, we really have no idea what's going on down here. We can't relate to it. But we really face the problem that all this kind of stuff might actually be gone before we get to say hello to some of these little people. Um, and it's, it's really frustrating that trying to get ahead of this wave of stuff that could actually cause a lot of damage. And at micro scale, we don't even know the scale at which these things live and exist in terms of whether they're unique at a micro scale or whether they, they're pandemic. Next one. Um, and the miners, are, this is the Indian Ocean, the miners are coming here, the Koreans messing around um, up in the middle, the Indians over there and the Chinese down here, again on the mid-ocean ridge. Martin will recognize this, this is where a bunch of fish are standing in the southern Indian Ocean Go fishing, next one. And this is an announcement they made with IOCN. This is um, the, the Deep Water Fisheries Association, the private fishers, getting their own act together to respond to the international community's interest in setting aside areas uh, for conservation as MPAs, um, ahead of governments, because they just got fed up waiting for governments, recognizing that the international community actually wants something to happen. So they haven't waited for that connectivity between words and actually they just gone and done it. But one of these reserves that these guys have set up actually is already overlapped by the Chinese operation. <coughs> the situation that Donna referred to is live today. This is really happening now. Next one. Um, similarly, this is the, the, the Australian supermarkets wondering about where their tuna are coming from. And you have to say, what on earth are they doing worrying about this? Something's really wrong when the supermarkets have to worry about where their tuna is coming um, and this is a little summary chart prepared for them, and again, I pitched this from them, so you can't have a copy of this either. Um, uh, this, is, th this is their assessment of, um, there's three columns you can see there. The first one is what the biomass of the fish is, as in, uh, you've still got fish around. The middle one is the level of fishing, uh, like, uh, are we really overfishing this area? The third one is bycatch, what kind of problems do these fisheries have for other species? Um, and you'll notice that the picture is sort of pretty bleak, especially at the bycatch end. That is to say, when you have a conversation about fisheries by fishers, it's usually only the target fish that get mentioned in the conversation. A lot of the other stuff that other people care about, like turtles and dolphins and seabirds and stuff, tend to get left out of the conversation. The supermarkets are really quite interested in this bit of the conversation, and the picture is generally pretty bleak. Next one. And this is um, tuna fishing in the, in the uh, Western Indian and uh, the Western Pacific. Notice over the last 30 years, they've got into fishing skipjack in quite a big way. That's the blue wedge. Um, and that's a, it's a huge thing. It's a big industry that's just developed. It hasn't been there forever like cod. Um, next one. And if you look at how the stock is doing, the green bits means it's sort of all right. The orange bits means it's sort of in trouble. And the red bits means it's cactus. Um, and you've got how much biomass along the right-hand side and how much fishing up, um, up, up the, uh, the left-hand axis. And you can see from small ones, the big eye was the, was the red bit at the bottom of the previous graph, irrelevantly small. Yellow fin was the yellow, fin, the yellow bit on the top, like sort of there. Um, both those fish, as you can 
see, is getting into serious trouble. But this little big eye, that's, this, that's the signature of a walking dead. It only needs the slightest perturbation in the system, and uh, one, eye, one year or two of recruitment failure in the population, and bang, it'll simply hit the wall. The level of fishing is so high that there's no way you can avoid a collapse if something has a hiccup. And remember, we're talking about wild capture fisheries here. We're not talking about beef on a farm. We're talking about things living in an open ocean system subject to unmanaged, unmanageable natural worlds. Things is, fluctuate and change. Is that in one of the other commodities? Yes, Western Central Pacific. That's the line. Yes. So you're criticizing the standards. That's the problem. Yeah, but they, everyone knows this, this is what they sit and watch and, and win and you know, they cry and wring their hands and carry on because no one's got the international power to say, hang on a minute, stop it. So people who care, who suffer when these things hit the wall are not in the conversation. This is a conversation about, about a few fisheries agencies, about a few fisheries. The, the people who matter are not in the conversation. Signs are it's getting pretty serious. The people who are actually inside the fishery are getting seriously uncomfortable about this. That is going to start heading up into the red zone in the next few years. And when that goes cactus, we're talking about a dozen failed states in the Pacific. This, this is not something that is conscionable for Australia. It's not something which is conscionable for the world. Next one. Um, and this is basically just the advisors to this supermarket saying, this is your brand on the line here. You need to think about what you're going to saying the tuna bun in the corner. Just to remind you, you've got you to think about this. Next one. Um, and similarly, this is, um, when we originally planned this, this thing, we were hoping that Robin Warner would be able to give a bit of a talk about environmental impact assessment. Um, again, there, there are people talking about how you can think about this, um, but unfortunately, they're not really in the conversation yet. This is the CBD, which is, again, having spent 10 years of my life trying to make it happen, I've got a bit of affection for it. But the problem is, it's regarded as the idiot cousin in the overall scheme of things. It, it's just not powerful uh, in, the, in the world. So it's really nice that they have uh, workshops about EIA. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Anyone who wants to go to live underground in Montreal, good luck to Next one. Um, and again, they have wonderful workshops where they really come to understand the problems you've got to deal with and what needs to be done. Next one. And work out that you've actually got a completely different legal framework to what you do with the watery bits, which is fishing world, and the bottom bits, which is mining world. Completely different institutional arrangements, completely different stakeholders. How on earth do you actually get this to, to work together? Next one. Um, and this is the grand, grand dream that we're beginning to try to put in place with the idea of an implementing agreement. That's the, the bit at the top. What is an implementing agreement designed to do? And one of the things it's designed to do is to drive integrated ocean management, to get the players to think about the other people in their sandbox with them. That you've actually got to be a lot more thoughtful about what you're doing. Um, and the idea of having ecosystem-based management on top of it is to try and get everyone to accept that there actually are some rules of the game. This is wild country. This isn't farmland. This is open country where natural processes drive and control everything. Um, and it only makes sense when you look at it from an ecosystem uh, based management point of view. What's the, manage what's the ecosystem doing? Uh, you know, and if we take a little bit out of it here and there, what, what happens? Trying to understand that is actually a profound challenge. Everybody in the game outside of camera, and possibly the, the Norwegian fishers, don't invest enough to actually understand that question. And this is a profound problem. We, we need so much more science and thinking and understanding and boat time, people getting eaten by sharks, to actually understand these systems uh, in order that those of us that choose to exploit them have a chance of doing so successfully. If you leave it to the exploiters to just talk about whether they're doing their bit successfully, it doesn't take a genius to work out where you eventually end up. Um, and there's a lot of it going about. And uh, the interesting thing, I, sorry, I put at the bottom, EIAs and MPAs, these are the two processes
processes which are sexual use independent. Having EIAs is a commitment to a higher public concern that is equal for all sectors. Having MPAs is a commitment to a conservation goal which is equal for all sectors. No sector owns the responsibility for doing EIA or owns the responsibility for MPA. They come from a concern with the wider international community. And this is the architecture we're trying to create right now, where the users comprehend that there is a broader international community that has an interest and an expectation about how the game will be played. Um, and here's another of the, the building blocks. This is the EPSA process. This is the CBD, the little idiot peasant, basically saying the world says to them, you can't do MPAs, we won't let you talk about management because that's far too important. We'll let you talk about the science of stuff. So we're all right, we'll do that. This is what we came up with. We came up with some criteria for areas of interest. Not MPAs, just nice looking stuff. And we had a bunch of workshops where we went and looked where these are, these areas are. We now stuck them in the repository in Montreal. Um, and they're designed to test the preparedness of other users to be cooperative. The CBD secretary will now submit this to these management bodies and say, hey, look, what we think is important. What are you going to do about this? The intention is that it will drive a whole era of cooperativeness, where sectoral users have to respond to envelopes coming in the mail from the CBD saying, we want you to take care of this. Next one. And one of the ways in which we think we can do this, one of the reasons why the RFMO debate is really interesting, fisheries do live in that natural world. The miners couldn't care a damn, the fishers couldn't care a damn. They, they don't really care about the ecosystem they're working with, the fishers do. Regional fisheries bodies do have all the essence and elements of bodies that do care about the environment. So the idea of converting them into bodies which can actually articulate this ecosystem framework within which sectors have to do things is, in our view, um, feasible. The bodies exist, the considerations exist. If we had to invent them again, it would be really hard. And anyway, even if we don't do all this, our promos need to lift the game anyway. So paying them lots of attention is a good thing, whatever else is going on. Um, and this someone else referred to, there's a lot of stuff going on. This is Impact 3, the, the, the world getting together to talk about MPAs. Ministerial high-level segment says, yep, okay, let's go and do it. This just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this is Kamala. Again, I'm walking wounded from Kamala <laughs> after 30 years. Um, this is uh, the Australian proposal put together on Thursday lunchtime and presented to a bunch of recalcitrant governments that I had the dubious pleasure of literally organising tea and sandwiches for, for a lunchtime brief to say, will you say yes to this? No. Um, um, but as I say, it's the first time we shine it. Time will tell. When I first started doing this game, there's only 100 countries, now there's 200 of them. These things take time. Uh, next one. Um, similarly, um, the World Bank thinks it should be getting involved in this, so they set up a global partnership for oceans and, they, uh, oceans and they set up uh, a blue ribbon panel to give them some advice on what they should do. They've just come out with this report called Indispensable Oceans. But, but no, aligning ocean health and human well-being. One of the key drivers going on here is trying to broaden the conversation about fisheries and in-situ ocean use away from the users and the institutions that that control and represent them into a global conversation about people who have an interest but not currently been in the, in the conversation. Whether the World Bank will do anything other than say thank you is a really interesting question. Um, similarly, Mission Blue, a bunch of US foundations um, uh, uh, around Silver Earl's um, hope spots. Um, uh, Silver Earl is the conservation of it, what Oprah Winfrey is to other people. <laughs> um, um, and basically there's a lot of science and knowledge behind this. There's basically a growing number of interesting spots around the world where you can say, this is a really kick-ass special spot, we should take care of it. But one of the really interesting questions for me is how we do that. Um, proposing to lock it up and throw away the key is really not an option. We're talking about fluid systems, no governance, all kinds of strange people around. Um, Entering the conversation of high seas, random, ungoverned stuff is really important. We have to be in that conversation 
with the people who currently occupy that space to, to win the island, to merely try and draw a line around and say, don't go there, um, it doesn't really sort of work for you. Next one. Um, and similarly, Hocker for Presses is a WWF report done by friends of ours from ANCORS, the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security, of which are at least five of you from ANCORS, thank you very much for coming. You've reduced the average age by at least 10 years. <laughs> um, um, to basically, all this stuff we've been talking about is the legal stuff. And there, there are a serious bunch of bad guys, who are not bad guys, they're just doing what they've always done. Um, but they, they pointedly drive through the system that governments try to work to try and bring some order out of chaos. Um, and whether it's okay to call them bad guys or not, it's a little tricky. Um, as in, some of them are just doing what they always do. But, but trying to break through this culture of disdain of what governments are trying to do is really important. And um, we've commissioned this report to try and project a strategy about how we can set up a framework of agreements uh, and arrangements that just makes it really hard for the bad guys to do this kind of stuff. And you realize almost immediately you're into the same world as the drug runners and the people runners and everything else. It's the same guys, sorry, it's the same kind of people, same kind of attitude to governments and, and sort of social values and mores doing this, this stuff. And we have to collaborate, cooperate as a broader international community to try and contain rather odd moral view about what's appropriate behaviour. Next one. And the, right now, we launched this report um, two days ago at an uh, Interpol meeting in uh, UNEP in, uh, in uh, Nairobi. And it's interesting that UNEP hosted it because they're really interested in getting into this, this illegal game. They want, to, they want to be a player in how the world's enforcement community deals with environmental crime. And turning bad stuff into crime is actually the first thing we've got to do. In many countries like Korea or Japan, their fisheries arrangements are set up to encourage fishers. The idea that you actually might want to discourage them from doing some stuff is a pretty weird idea. Next one. Um, and sorry, this is just my final one, but Don has done it all, and it's embarrassing because Robert Hill's in the room, but this is all the stuff that he made happen over the last few years, but for which I'm most grateful, and I'm really happy to have been a little bit of a gremlin in the background. Constituencies or pressure groups, or from your experience, could um, could derail that momentum. Thank you for a very difficult question. I recognize that you foreshadowed that earlier. I tried to allude it a little bit to the answer in my response, which was um, the lead up to Rio plus twenty was really important for the Australian government. 
in that we had a very uh, open process of stakeholder input. This was one of the issues coming up in, in Rio Plus 20, as you're aware. And I think it was a number of preparatory meetings had happened on a regional basis with the Pacific Island countries in Indonesia and other areas. And those countries were raising this issue. And they're very important neighbors to Australia. We have joint interests, as well as the public interest here was seeing it as, as it was about time Australia got off the fence. And so it was during that about year-long real process that the shift happened. Uh, so what, what could be a change? I would say if there was um, some unexpected pressure from other countries on Australia. So what is the current position of the US? Um, not that I would ever want to try to speak for another country. <laughs> The U.S. has said in the meeting in, in August at the United Nations, and so I'm, not, I'm just paraphrasing what they said publicly, uh, which is that they believe that existing agreements can uh, fulfill the need. That proper implementation, so the arguments are that you have the UN FISDOX agreement, but it isn't ratified by, by enough countries. You have a number of other agreements in place, but they're not effectively implemented. So if the effort was put into effective implementation and more people signed up to the existing agreements, you don't need another new instrument. 